Coming up, we're dressed and ready to go out. We'll get our nails done. Love it. It's all about red nail polish. You anything red, okay? And get glammed for the cocktail hour. We stretch it out with a pair of miracle leggings. There's nothing else that feels as soft on your skin. But first, a day at the ballpark takes us right to the source for the perfect cap. If you're going to buy a baseball cap, buy a new era one. This is Style Factory. The baseball cap, a uniquely American fashion piece that began with baseball and swept the globe thanks to hip hop and pop culture. Rap icons like Jay-Z or Missy Elliott are really responsible for resurrecting the baseball cap. I think Jay-Z has been wearing the Yankees baseball cap since before he was even a rapper, probably. Yep, Jay-Z's claim that he made the Yankees cap more famous than a Yankee can is probably true because now, Everyone wears them. Like the second I moved to New York, the first thing I did was buy my Yankees cap. Baseball caps have always been cool, and they'll always be cool. If you wear a cap, more likely than not, it's, it's New Era. New Era and baseball caps go together like peanuts and Cracker Jacks. And nobody on the planet understands that better than Chris Cook, fourth generation hat maker. New Era was started by my great grandfather in 1919, when we started to be provided for Major League Baseball all the way back in 34. 59 years later, in 1993, New Era became the exclusive provider of on-field caps for major league players, knocking their competition out of the park. We had become the largest uh, headwear supplier to major league baseball. Everyone felt that we were the right company to fill that contract. It has become the gold standard for baseball caps. If you're going to buy a baseball cap, buy a New Era one. Now. New Era makes the official caps for all 30 Major League Baseball teams. And every player wears the 5950, a fitted cap designed for peak performance and optimized for style. It's worn on the field of play in Major League Baseball. But then, you know, there's also fans that are wearing that cap because of its uh, iconic sort of stature. We wear a lot of New Eras. And we Jeremy visited Scott. our factory in Buffalo. They're our favorite. And the factory outside Buffalo, New York, is still where New Era cranks out four million caps every year. Each one starts as a computerized design, a collaboration between the teams and New Era's design manager, Sean. Black, red, white is a color that runs good for us all throughout the year. But we like to do seasonal colors too. So usually in the summer, people like brighter colors. And usually if we're doing more towards like a fall or holiday, you know, camos and earth tones and darker colors. But Sean doesn't have to tamper with the Yankees cap. It's a classic, made from midnight navy, not black, fabric. Eyelet holes around the crown allow sweaty heads to breathe and maximize comfort. The visor is a fabric filled with a board to block out the sun on those pot flies. And of course, there's the notorious logo embroidered in contrasting white thread that makes you part of the team. Every Yankees cap starts as a roll of polyester, ready to be cut. So the hydraulic cutting machine works uh, by a computer program where it basically lays out the best efficiency and the use of the material. And it nests things together based on getting the least amount of, of waste. With baseball being as traditional as it is, we worked for a long time to to develop a uh, performance fabric that still looked and felt like wool that we introduced in 2007. Two crown pieces are sewn together to make the front panel, and two more make the back panel. The front panel is then sent to embroidery. Here, tiny packed loops emboss the Yankees logo in white thread. The average team logo needs about 6,000 individual stitches and the Yankees logo is the best seller. It's probably the most recognized. The Yankees, that's the team. The front panel is then heat pressed to something called hair cloth, which gives the front panel the shape and structure it needs to support the thick embroidered logo. 
the crown panels get their ventilating eyelet holes punched in and embroidered by the same machine. Now, the crown is ready to be formed. A pretty simple process when you think about it. A side panel is sewn onto the front, a side panel is sewn onto the back. Now you have two halves, so then the two halves are sewn together to make the crown. Once the crown is formed, the snap button is popped on top. The crown needs to get sized, which is done with this sizing strip. In fitted caps, there's two sizes made from, from each cut. And without the snapback clasp, there's no room for adjustments. Now we have a great Yankees beanie, but the cap is missing the visor. So the two pieces of crescent-shaped fabric are joined. Then the visor board, often assumed to be cardboard, is inserted. The visor board was never really made of cardboard. Um, it's made by a series of fibers that are compressed together in, in a board that holds up and it keeps its shape. The visor is supposed to be a practical thing that keeps the sun off your face. But fashion doesn't always play by the rules. I always wear my baseball cap backwards. Yeah, I wear it backwards too. Then the visor is sewn onto the base of the crown before a sweatband is added. And finally, the labels are attached. After the cap passes inspection, an official New Era sticker is attached to the visor. A lot of people do leave the visor stickers on, and that's just sort of become a trend that hasn't gone away. Sticker or no sticker, the Yankees cap is ready to hit the streets. Or of course, Yankee Stadium. Play ball. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the show fair. Four is one, one, two, two, two three strikes, you're out at the old, old ball ball game. Ball, ball, ball. You've got one. The leggy, fail-safe hanging in your closet that takes you from drinks to dinner and beyond. I think every girl should own a cocktail dress. That's very important because you never know. The cocktail dress is stylishly reliable. Embellished or plain, jewel-toned or black, flowing or nipped at the waist. This dress can be many things. It just can't be long. A cocktail dress is typically determined by its length, somewhere in and around the knee length, something a little bit more fun and flirty than what you think about for an evening dress. It's a great way to focus all the attention to your legs. In this day and age, a lot of things can be a cocktail dress, but generally speaking, when it's party time, I think a little bling, a little glitz, all those things are good details to have in a cocktail dress. This is Nicole Miller. For the last 30 years, she's been designing effortless, ultra-feminine creations like this little number, the Jackard Sparkle Dot Off-Shoulder Cocktail Dress. Nicole Miller is very simple and conservative, but like she also has a bit of an edge. I think the secret to her success is that she really knows a woman's body. She is feminine, and people know what to expect when they come to her. Like if you put my dress on, that puts a smile on your face. Nicole's the one smiling after 30-plus years as a famous fashion designer. A status she built with good, old-fashioned hard work. I was always very determined, and I just kept really focused on my goal. Her success hit high speed in the 1990s, otherwise known as the era of the supermodel. Linda Evangelista, Naomi Campbell, and Christy Turlington all walked her shows. Today, Nicole creates three lines a year, out of this 17,000 square foot facility in New York's Garment District, where every design starts with a sketch. I wanted to do a dress that was rather sexy, but I wanted it to also be sweet, even though it has kind of an off-shoulder, low-cut neckline, which is kind of very much the style these days. I gave it like a poofy skirt, which I felt made it feel a little more whimsical, a little more fun, and a little more youthful. I think the tulip shape for a dress, it's really appealing because it really emphasizes the waist, which is amazing for every woman. As for the fabric, Nicole decides on this silver lurex dot jacquard woven with lycra, an elastane fiber that can stretch up to six times its original length, giving it the room to complement many different silhouettes. It looks like a neutral with a little bit of a color to it. So it's not overwhelming. And my customer seems to like stretch better. Nicole is ready to transform the sketch into a sample pattern. She does this with Dorilla, the in-house pattern maker, a nod to her haute couture roots. I studied draping in Paris, and to me, it's always really important to have the 
clothing draped here as much as I can, especially if it's a complicated dress. And that one had some really, you know, interesting lines to it. The pattern is made right on a dress form. And that lands uh, about uh, three inches below the underarm. Yeah. When you're dealing with a body conscious dress, you're just following those lines quite directly. Now, if you have a looser dress, you might have to start another way. So you might be making the silhouette first and then you do the lines on afterwards. And whether the fabric stretches or not is always really important. So there's a lot of technical stuff going on and I love the technical aspect of it. So here on the bodice, we're gonna start, you know, about one inch the width of the sleeve and we're gonna gradually get wire over the bust. Okay. It's about an inch there, inch and a quarter. The number one thing to do is to get the lines right, to get the proportions of all the seaming right. So it's almost starting to look like a dress. Now that the proportions are mapped out, they start creating the pattern's pieces. We're making the pattern in non-stretch, but the fabric was, will stretch, so it will really hug the body. The next phase of production is cutting the fabric. Jacquard fabric is spread out onto a cutting table by Ramash. Each component of the dress is cut out by hand and bundled for sewing. The bodice is first woven together, then the sleeve linings are attached to it. Yu Ying adds the skirt at the waist before a zipper is sewn into the back. So how does the dress feel? But Nicole's work is never done. We fit it on a model and we perfect the pattern. So I'm just wondering if we need like tulle in here because it's very soft and we might want to make it a little crisper okay. if we had some tulle in it. For a first sample, it fits remarkably well. A cocktail dress that's equal parts sexy and stylish so you can be the life of any party. I like the material, I like the fabric, and I like the color. And I also like the fact that it's off the shoulder and then has like a bit of a rounded hip line, which makes it a little edgy. And I was thinking, if you were really brave, you'd go for blue suede shoes. <laughs> It's easy to understand the allure of leggings. I wear leggings, they're my travel pants. Leggings are now so ubiquitous and have revolutionized pants, basically. They're the cozy, stretchy, go-to pants worn by celebrities and regular folk alike. Or are they tights? I can never keep that one straight. In my world, I'm not sure if I'm right, but tights have feet. Donna Smith is the co-founder and creative director of Mink, the company that makes these sporty, opaque Lisa 2 leggings in black. We've designed it so that it's almost like a control top. So it starts here, and you fold it over and wear it on your hip, and it just basically smooths everything out and holds everything in, but feels amazing. That's because fashion and function are treated equal at this Toronto-based company. The mix style is classic with an edge, something that you would feel put together with very little effort. And very much about being comfortable as well because our clothing is so soft and it's got such stretch. Qualities they attribute to the leggings' key material, bamboo. I don't even know how they create things out of bamboo. Because they do sheets, they do leggings, they do like underwear, but it makes it so soft. It's like the best fabric on earth. Bamboo textiles were first developed in the late 19th century, but initially only for household products and items. The use of bamboo for clothing actually only developed much more recently. And today, it's one of the most sustainable materials out there. It doesn't require water to grow. It doesn't require fertilizers or pesticides. It grows faster than any other plant, up to three feet a day. Mick has paired with a local mill called Rupa Knitting to create the perfect blend for their leggings. 90% bamboo and 10% lycra. So the amazing thing about bamboo is people think of it as a, a woody plant, but you'd never think that to make it into a fabric, this is what it needs to become. It's uh, basically spun into a fiber and then brought to yarn form, and this is what we use to produce the fabric. There's nothing else that feels as soft on your skin, and it has such a beautiful stretch to it. To make the sheets of bamboo fabric, they're knitted using this extraterrestrial-looking circular machine. The bamboo yarn is fed into the front side of the needle bed, and the lycra is fed in right behind it. The pattern is synced to a computer and the knitter's 2,800 needles run in a circular motion to weave every sheet, which takes about an hour. The needles come up, they'll grab a yarn, and then as they come down, they'll, 
They'll knit that yarn into the previous one. And what happens is they knit together in a series of loops to create a fabric. And it just free falls into this box. Once the fabric is finished, we will cut it and we package it up and we send it to the dye house. The dye house is another independent business Mick works with. It enables us to oversee the quality literally from thread to hanger. Here, rolls of fabric are slit open and sewn together to create one continuous piece. The lycra is elastic fiber, and if you put it in the, in the water, it's going to shrink a lot. So the fabric is fed onto a tenter frame, where it's stretched and exposed to heat to help it retain its shape while dyeing. That happens in these tanks, where the bamboo fabric sits in a dye bath for up to seven hours to get that perfect, opaque shade. There's something about bamboo, the way it takes to the dye. The color looks a bit faded in the cotton and looks more intense and saturated in the bamboo. It means that you don't have that problem of it being see-through. But the leggings' history is much more colorful than that. The stockings were actually first worn by men. And during the 15th century, there was this trend called mi parte, which actually meant each leg would be a different color. It's a very, very strong look. Now that the fabric is dry, about 20 sheets are batched onto rolls and shipped to one of Mick's production partners in Toronto to make the leggings. Once we get in the bamboo fabric, we make a marker for cutting. The leggings' individual pieces are cut, and Barb can start the sewing process at her station. Here, she puts the waistband together with a top stitch before sewing in the label. Then, she sews the leg pieces together and attaches them to the waistband. Finally, they're hemmed, pressed, and tagged. And you have a pair of Lisa 2 opaque leggings that are simple, comfortable, and give legs a perfectly smooth silhouette, as long as you're wearing them the right way. We all know when we've seen a legging gone wrong. That means that it's sheer. It means that you're seeing visible underwear lines or that camel toe. I'm sorry, the dreaded camel toe. You don't want to go there. Just make sure that your top is long enough because no one wants to see that. Please. Nail polish has been lighting up the tips of our fingers one way or another for centuries. An early form of nail polish was actually developed in China as early as 3000 BC from a mixture of ingredients like beeswax, egg white, and vegetable dyes. But now, decorating our nails is a modern essential. I love nail art. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> if I had to guess how many bottles of nail polish I have in the region of 40 or 50. I love to spend time, like millions of hours whenever I'm, I'm doing my nails, choosing like this red or this white. Meet Jeff Pink, the passionate founder of Orly International, based in sunny Los Angeles, California. I love this company big time and even today after 40 years in the business when i walk to the front door of this company i enjoyed it just like it started yesterday love it jeff knows better than anyone that nail trends change like the weather except one trusty standby a constant in a world of change this is our thread very popular shades one of the best shades that we sell Love it. It's all about red nail polish. Anything red, okay? Red nails, red lips, red toes, red. I love red nail polish, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm wearing red polish right now. I definitely think of Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. I mean, that was totally a moment that glamorized red nails all over again. Orly Beauty's Haute Red started like all Orly products, as color concepts with the design team. Red is one of those random shades. It's kind of always on trend. Like, you can always use it. It's the color of passion. It's the color of love. Once the color is decided, the coat's in the lab. Today it's Dan. Whip up a test batch. As artistic as makeup can be, the chemists play a big role developing perfect colors and textures. The lab team plays with nail polish all day. In a way, kind of like many of our first manicure experiments. I think most of our first do-it-yourself manicures were with that white liquid corrector in the middle of class. Yeah, we used to permanent marker our nails and do our own nail art before they actually had the real nail art. Once Dan's batch is ready, he performs a few simple tests to make sure the polish meets Jeff's and the FDA's high standards. 
The polish should take only two coats for a perfect application, and it's designed to be chip resistant. Nothing looks worse than a chipped red mani. It's better to just wipe it off yourself and go bare nail than it is to go chip nail. After testing, the batch is finally ready for mass production. It's a simple process now, but red polish hasn't always had it so easy. In the 1950s, red nails were seen as quite risque. Some churches actually required women remove their polish before they entered for the service. Orly's Haute Red still makes a big impact. Top secret ingredients are poured into a paint drum and mixed for about five minutes. Meanwhile, empty bottles are loaded onto the filling conveyor. Once the polish has emulsified, it will be a perfect batch of Haute Red. The bottles are filled 10 at a time and moved to the capping station, where they are, you guessed it, capped. They get date stamped, so you know when it goes bad. I actually keep them in my fridge, which I read somewhere was a good idea. By keeping it in the refrigerator does not help at all. You can put it in room temperature. That's the perfect way to do it. The bottles are boxed, ready for stores, salons, manicures, and pedicures around the world. If you're going to wear red, which is super sexy, I think like a square nail will look super great on you.